welcome everyone. We're gonna uh, start. We're gonna show a quick video, and then we will get started. Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are PreMedCC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students. People that lack the financial resources or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speaker. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Cristina Martinez, and I am a second year medical student at UC Davis. Uh, before I went to medical school, I was a community college student, like maybe a good chunk of you here today. And I went to Santa Monica College for a few years, then did a few years also here in Sacramento at Sac City College and American River College. And then I transferred to UC Davis where I graduated with a degree in pharmaceutical chemistry. And between med school, starting med school and finishing my degree, I mainly did community, uh, I'm sorry, community service too, which hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about. But um, as a job, I mainly worked at Stanford as a clinical research coordinator. And I'm really excited to be here today. Hi everyone, my name is Marlisa Olea Gallardo. Um, I went to undergrad at San Diego State University where I double majored in microbiology and sociology and got a minor in religious studies. After graduating, I took a few post back years. I did an unofficial post back through UCLA extension. Um, and at the time I actually worked as a banker because that was what paid me well enough to be able to afford applying to med school. Um, I'm a first year now at UC Davis. And I'm really happy to be here, involved with a lot of great orgs that I'm sure we'll talk about later too. You're muted. Okay, uh, why don't we have Juan go and then um, Nina has some technical challenges, but she'll throw the laptop around and get it to work. Sure thing. Hi everyone, my name is Juan Florena Muniz and I am a first year medical student here at UC Davis School of Medicine. I'm originally from the small town of Williams, California. And for undergrad, I went to CSU Sacramento where I studied biology with a concentration in biomedical science. Um, Prior to medical school, I was involved uh, mainly working as a farm laborer um, in my in my community, um, just working for various uh, different jobs in, in agriculture, really. And 
currently as a first year medical student, as Melissa pointed out, um, currently involved in a bunch of different organizations and activities. So we'll be talking about that um, in a bit. I can go since uh, uh, we're just waiting for Nina to like come back uh, after pick. So yeah, so my name is Julio Siliaser. I am a second year medical student at UC Davis, just like uh, my class with Nina and Cristina. And um, yeah, so I was actually born um, in El Salvador and lived there in Argentina for about 15 years before we went to the U.S. And I lived uh, mostly in L.A., went to um um, moved to Bay Area, and in the Bay Area, I went to school at San Jose State, and I graduated back in 2013. So um, before before going to medical school, I did a lot of running jobs, and one of those included just working in finance and I wealth management for a good five years. And I transitioned into doing uh, um, work at the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the Refugee Clinic for about two years. After that, uh, at the same time, I was just taking classes, post back classes at um, UC Berkeley Extension. Uh, something I didn't mention, I, I went to community college my first two years and transferred to San Jose State. Um, so after that, I, yeah, I've been two years in, here in UC Davis and it's going pretty good. So I'm happy to be here with all my classmates as well. Okay, is it my turn? <laughs> yes. Great. So sorry about the audio issues before, but hi, everybody. My name is Nina. I am a second year at UC Davis. Um, <clears throat> I went to Berkeley. I'm originally from Los Angeles and I went to Berkeley, studied English. After doing that, I went and actually did some research at UCSF and then I pivoted into business. So I was there for about four years and I was mainly in advertising, working with predominantly my clients were Google and Levi's and then decided that I wanted to go into medicine. So I went to a post back at UC San Diego for a year. And after I completed that, um, I applied to medical school. And during that interim period, I was over at Airbnb helping with their IPO and then started at Davis. So I also kind of similar to Julio had a long time between the point at which I had graduated college and actually entered medical school. Great, awesome. So everybody has a very diverse background. Uh, I think we have a first question Jessica is gonna ask. Yeah, um, so our first question is how much, oh, how many of you did research and how much research did you guys do? I could start maybe. <laughs> um, so I did about two years of research at UCSF. Um, I did it for a neurologist and like cross-departmental work, but basically it was for autism and then I, I don't know if the question is out of like whether or not research might be needed for entrance into medical school, but if it is, let me know and I can try to help answer at least my point of view on that. Um, and then from that research, I had two papers that were published. And then currently I'm doing research across mostly neurological surgery, but also in quality improvement in different sort of like sectors. So whether that's internal medicine or for like thoracic, which Julio and I are doing together too. Um, so similar to Nina, I did work at um, the Department of Public Health and we had um, the opportunity to work with the family medicine residency department there. And then uh, mostly it was more in just one project there while I was working. This was like about two years before uh, medical school started, before the pandemic pretty much. And it was just a, a project involving um, chronic um, non-communicable diseases on the refugee populations that would come to our clinic. So it was working with a fellow at uh, UCSF. And here, I would say in, in medical school, I do I am involved in a couple of uh, uh, projects, both in surgery, the one with Nina, working in cardiothoracic, a couple of other ones in, also in CT, and some um, that involve just like, more community projects as well in the student-run clinic. So we have a lot of student-run clinics, which is pretty cool. I can share a little bit about my research experience. So I actually did not do a lot of research in undergrad. I was part of one 
like volunteer study that I did, a clinical research study in Tracy. Um, and that was a really unique and awesome opportunity, but that happened basically when I was done at UC Davis. And um, as far as my like work experience, so between undergrad and starting med school, I did three years of clinical research at Stanford, and that was at different departments. So there was a time where I was working on a longitudinal study. Um, it was a huge study, kind of similar to all of us. I don't know if anybody has heard of that, but this huge biobank study basically trying to see whether they can predict um, chronic illnesses like heart disease and cancer. And that was a lot of fun. And um, during the pandemic, obviously the focus is of a lot of institutions shifted to try and find some sort of treatment for COVID. So I started doing that um, probably like a year and a half or maybe just the last year before starting medical school. It just felt like forever, but uh, that was a lot of fun as well. And that, that involved a lot more medications and um, following up on adverse events and things like that. But um, yeah, that is my experience with research. Yeah, um, okay. So our next question is if you guys could share your transition into medical school and what was um, your first year like and how did you cope with the large volume of the curriculum? I'm happy to um, answer this. So first year is a lot, um, I'm not gonna lie, but it's also really fun. And I think it really depends on the school that you go to. So something that's really nice about Davis is that our curriculum is pass fail. And that leads for a really collaborative environment. So um, our peers are very helpful with like sending us resources. We do like study groups together. Um, and so while the transition was a lot, I think we had a really great community with us. And then the pass fail curriculum, whether you get a hundred percent or a 60%, like your transcript says the same thing. Um, and it, that doesn't mean that it's like easy to pass because you still have to work hard <laughs> and study, um, but it does alleviate some of the pressure. And then I think time management is really big. Um, so like, for example, this week on Wednesday, we had a class from eight to 12. I stayed on campus until five, getting all of my work done. And then I went home and I was able to relax for the rest of the night, right? Because I was able to um, accomplish everything that I needed. And not every day looks like that, but most days can look like that if you budget your time correctly. Anyone else? In terms of the transition, I don't know, Julia, do you want to go first? I know you go ahead, Nina. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I think at least for me, like having work experience and situations where it was so pressured and there were like a lot of different things at stake, different to medicine, but certainly like for in in my world like money was like a really big thing and so meeting the bottom line or like ma maximizing margins and things like that and I think when you experience different pressures in different ways it only kind of helps you in medical school and the other thing that I would add is in terms of the transition um similar to the point that was made earlier about how pass fail is really like it comes in clutch I would say that it totally does I would like even go so far as to say getting into medical school is harder than medical school. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that when you're in a pass fail world, like the priorities sort of shift and you certainly want to become a good clinician. But one of the things that my mentor tells me like all the time is the point of medical school is to match into the residency that you want to go into. And so um, while there might be a lot of academia in terms of like the class material and what you need to just learn to pass, one of the other priorities becomes what residency do you want to go or what specialty do you want to match into? And if it happens to be a really competitive one, then you have to shift your priorities so that you can become the best candidate for that. And I think clicking into that reality helps the transition into medical school a little bit smoother because you kind of know what you want to do or at a minimum what you want to explore. And then everything kind of like tunnels down from there. And so I would say that if there are stresses now, it's not that it won't stop in medical school, but there are 
so many benefits that are kind of being gained just through the process of like understanding how to manage your time now so that when you go into medical school, it's not like a new experience for you. Um, and so I'll pause there and give it to Julio. Um, I was going to say something similar to to what you said, Nina, because like uh, similar to to what she mentioned, I when I before medical school, I worked in pretty much in wealth management for since I was like 23, 24 until uh, 28, so about almost eight, almost, I mean, almost four or five years in, in that setting. So kind of um, what I learned is like, there, there's like a lot of pressures in that job. It might be different. It might be not like called purely academic. Like you see, like what we think about in medical school, but it does help you kind of like set the priorities, say what do you want to achieve at your job? And that's something similar that you have in medical school. That like what Nina mentioned, it depends on where you want to end up. Um, and all of the specialties that you are in medical school does allow you the opportunity to, to shape your curriculum and what you want to do extracurricular in order to, to ultimately match you in, in, in what you want to do as a future doctor. Um, but at the same time, like the, like the pass fail, I think it's like the greatest thing ever. Like, honestly, if we didn't, if we had grades, I would love like freaking out all the time, but <laughs> since we don't have that, do you have, uh, you can just study to pass and all the other energies that you have, you can pour them into like, maybe you love community care. You go and work in a community, like setting your clinic as much as you want, make those connections, be involved in research, go shout anesthesia or whatever you want to do and build those connections so it allows you to do that so in that setting um as long as before medical school my advice is if you have been in an environment that puts a lot of pressure in work it will help you in medical school because you can set priorities and that's what i think the most valuable thing that that a work environment taught me before medical school Right. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, there's a couple of people asking about their majors. Some people are majoring in biology, others in public health, and some are wondering is major important and if they they should switch to a science based degree as opposed to like a public health degree or it doesn't matter. Okay, um, I studied English in college, and so I would say it doesn't matter. Um, but maybe I think like what are you, what's the goal here? And so what does matter is excelling in the pre med prerequisites, and you know whether that's your organic chemistry or biochemistry classes. And I think um, medical school admissions committees are a little bit more understanding than one might think. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you don't do well and say your second semester or your last quarter of OCHEM, it's not the end of the world. And it doesn't mean that you will not gain entrance into medical school. What medical school admissions committees often want to see is, can you explain yourself well, or do we see an upward trajectory where you're doing better? And I know a lot of people who didn't elect to become mole bio majors or like chemistry majors, and they totally got into medical school. So I would say that it, it's, um, those four years are your own. And if, if you want to go into medicine, that's awesome. But medicine is like, they call it like a marriage. It's almost like forever. And it's this contract that you kind of like get into. And so if you want to explore things before this marriage, then like try that during college. Um, and it, it will not hurt you at all to have studied something else. And uh, I think one asterisk that I would put is that when we had applied, like, are humanities majors more likely to get into medical school because you're seen as this like non-traditional applicant? I would say it's neither here nor there at this point um, as far as admissions goes. Yeah, I, I would, be, go ahead, Julia. No, I will say like something yeah, similarly. Um, I, I did major in finance and accounting, so it was nothing to do with anything medicine related. So, but it, it did gave me like an understanding of things that are outside of biology things that I, I would say like that i enjoyed that are not related to medicine just like how the financial system works how it's like you know why why there's like how the money flow what do people do with their money all, all, all the things that that you can talk about in an application for example or you talk about like in an interview or things like that and that that, that gives you a better understanding of a lot of other issues but like uh, um like Nina was mentioning, the, the classes that do matter are all those pre-med classes. And you do well on that, and you do well on the MCAT. Um, 
like admissions committee don't really care if what is your major, honestly. Like, uh, um, I like this this uh, this past um, year was able to sit on the on the like the screening committee for applications at the medical school, and then everybody is uh, when you get screened and everybody kind of like suits your app. When they see like a variety of applicants, it's it's everybody does something different. So so the way you make sure excel and the way you all the skills that you gain before medical school are the ones that you need to portray in your application in order to kind of like seem as a complete person, which is what I feel a lot of medical schools value. Yeah. I also want to add really quickly that medicine is so much more than science. I think it intertwines really heavily with a bunch of other disciplines. And so Nina majoring in English, like health literacy is really big and a big portion of like how we serve our communities. Julia majoring in finance, right? We know that medicine runs based off of insurances. So understanding that stuff is really important. Uh, one of my majors was sociology. So like social justice and like who has access to healthcare and why do they have access to healthcare? Does it look different than other people's? And so um, medicine is truly like interdisciplinary. And yes, there's chemistry and phys and bio and all that scary stuff that's on the MCAT. Um, but being a multidimensional person who understands medicine from several aspects, I think is also a really big, important part of being um, a successful med student. Can you, can you guys talk about like, and I know um, Julio is on the committee. Do you guys like, if somebody has like a bachelor's in bioengineering, do you guys like, start dancing versus somebody who has an English degree. And also if the person in the bioengineering degree, if they have a 3.0 or if the English major has a 4.0, which one is looked at? I mean, can you talk about that? Because I think there's this thing about, you know, pre-meds have to be these specific sexy majors that everybody gets excited about. How many times did you get excited about majors? That from your experience on the committee? Um, what I would say is like a lot of, um, your, the application goes through a lot of screeners and pretty much like Davies likes to, to see people that have a lot of distance travel. And that means, you know, like uh, usually people that have overcome very like adversities in their life because those could be like uh, financial adversities maybe you grew up in a different country maybe you did a different career and transition into medicine a lot of those things are very valuable to the school and they they screen those people like uh, uh uh like very well so they don't necessarily focus i don't i can't, I can't tell about the other medical schools but here they don't necessarily focus solely on the major that you had but um but they do see in academics, they do see like the your grades, for example. Though that that's always like relevant. So you do have to do the best you can in those grades that uh, uh, are counted for your science GPA and the community GPA, most likely, and do well on the MCAT because those things are plays. Those things are what kind of like screens from almost every single medical school. Um, so you do have to do well on that. But 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 for a specific major. They, they, I would, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter as much. And it's just because like people major in very different things that apply to medical school now is you see everything from political science to finance to um, English majors to Spanish, Romance languages I've seen in the apps, like everything. Um, and it just depends on how those things contributed to you being, you know, the applicant that you are. And those are the things that the medical school kind of is, likes to see. Um, some people are asking, going back to the pass and fail situation, um, what happens if you fail a class and do they do ranking and how does it impact your residency? I guess I can talk about this. Um, so if you fail a class, you remediate um that block and basically what that means is like they give you another chance to take the test again um and then you take the test again and you're probably going to pass um and you're allowed to remediate a block three times at davis and if you remediate like if you take the makeup test and you pass the class you pass the class and it never shows up on your transcript so you can remediate a block three times before a fail shows up on your transcript 
Um, and so they really want you to succeed here at Davis. In terms of the ranking, <clears throat> we do not have ranking here at Davis, but there are other medical schools that do. And so I think depending on the medical school that students on this call may be interested in, it's just worth taking a look at their website to see if they have something called AOA status, which is like their honors version. And typically AOA will be composed of different elements. And one of those elements might be that you're the top 25% of the class or that you honor throughout clerkship, which is your third year and you go into the hospitals and actually take part in different specialties. And so to that question, um, at least at Davis, they do not rank. And it would be very ironic if we were on a pass fail system, yet we were still ranked. Like it kind of doesn't make sense. Um, but there are schools that do, and there are still schools, though a very small minority, that are graded rather than pass fail. And somebody wanted to know uh, can you fail medical school? Um... Can anybody share their experience? Anybody knows about that? Yeah, it's very difficult to fail medical school. They will make every effort unless you quit yourself um, because it's a public institution. The legislators, uh, I, I think that the number was $237,000 on top of what medical students pay for tuition in California to go to a California medical school. So they will do everything to make sure you pass because if there's not a lot of people that don't pass, then there'll be some issues with the legislators. So um, yeah, I, like I said, the only person, I, I only know one person that withdrew and it was because of medical reasons, um, but they just couldn't continue because their body gave out on them. But that was, but yeah. Um, this is a question everybody asks about what you did in undergrad in terms of volunteer work, um, discovering your what you're interested in medicine, you know, all of those secrets that everybody else wants to do to replicate. So can you guys share about those secrets? I just refuse to answer a question first. So like somebody else has to go because I've answered too many questions first. I feel like Juan hasn't talked. So maybe Juan should talk. Yeah, that's what they're going to say. I was like, Juan, <laughs> Juan or Christina. I was like, they, they, I'm sure they both did like good, great stuff. Oh, uh, sure thing. Go ahead. Um, so I, as I mentioned before previously, I went to Sacramento State. Um, also known as CSU Sacramento. Um, in my time there as an undergraduate, uh, I pretty much got myself involved in a bunch of different extracurriculars. Uh, it's one of the events or programs or, or rather clubs that we had there was the Chicanos and Latinos in Health Education or CHE, which was a pre-med organization for students like myself who are of a Hispanic, Latino origin, uh, who have a desire to go into medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and this is really more of a support group to support each other. And really to organizations like that, that and MAPS, the Medical Association of Pre-Medical Students, uh, really got me involved with the various different opportunities that were available in the Sacramento area that allowed me to go to do shadowing at Sacramento General Hospital here in Sacramento. Um, and additionally, um, through a program at my at Sac State called the Science Educational Equity Program, I was able to meet my mentor, um, who is a pulmonologist over in Reading. And fortunately, he was able uh, allowed to let me shadow him on various occasions. So for me, that was pretty much my pathway as far as how, how I kind of navigated um, getting experience and kind of getting an understanding like this is what I want to do uh, moving forward. And if even if, if that's just a little snippet of that, you know, I could expect so much more when I'm a medical student. And fortunately, that's been the case. I can go next. Um, so I actually didn't know I wanted to go to medical school until well, like basically when I was close to graduating from UC Davis, so after I had transferred, and like I mentioned, I went to community college for a few years. I was in LA, I um, and then I moved here, and I was not like a very good student. So um, at that time, medical school or even the health professions weren't really like on my radar very much. But um, I did start working at a pharmacy mainly because I was tired of working in um, food service because it was just like a lot of late nights and it's hard work. I was working at a pizza shop mainly when I was in LA. 
And it was a lot of fun, but like I said, it's hard work. I didn't really have time to study. And although I didn't re uh, really know what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to keep going to school and like get a bachelor's and eventually have a career that pays pretty well and that I'd be happy in. Um, so I started working at, at a pharmacy. I got my farm tech license. And um, that's really when I started liking healthcare a lot and seeing it as something that I wanted to do, but it didn't feel like a reality because my transcript was so bad, <laughs> you know, like straight up. I did not have great grades. I had to repeat a lot of classes actually um, that I either failed or got D's in in community college. And um, yeah, so it, it was something that I was interested in, but something that didn't really feel like a reality. But um, then I transferred to UC Davis. I kept working at a pharmacy. And at that time I was like, okay, well, I might wanna actually pursue becoming a pharmacist and you know, see if that's a possibility. And I ended up, thank God, you know, doing well when I transferred to UC Davis um, because I was just really motivated to, to have this be a career, to do something in healthcare. And, um, and yeah, so luckily I, I started that upward trend in my GPA that Nina and Julio and, and um, folks talked about. And um, then it started to become more of a reality. And as, as I started to think about the future, you know, and, and whether pharmacy was really for me and talking to a lot of pharmacists about what they enjoyed most about their career. And also what I really liked was, um, was just connecting with the patients. And you're pretty limited um, in pharmacy in terms of like how much you can connect with the patient and the scope of what you're able to do and how much you're able to help your community. So that's when I decided like, man, I, I really think I'm gonna take another few years between graduating Davis and, um, and applying to med school and I'm just gonna go for it. And, um, and yeah, so it was kind of like a roundabout way, but it was my last year at Davis, even though I was on this track to becoming a pharmacist that I decided that it wouldn't be enough for me, you know, and then that's not really what I wanted to do, so. I decided to take time off to do a post back. I didn't mention that at first, but I did do a post back at Berkeley Extension to continue that upward trend and be a good candidate, um, take the MCAT. So really work on my academics as much as I could. And in between build those experiences that I thought would, would make me a good candidate for medical school. And also that would make me a good future physician, which is why I got involved in research and, um, in several community service that are like numerous to list, but um, I was like a reading tutor and I also volunteered at Shriners Hospital for some time um, among other things. But um, yeah, so to anybody out there who maybe has this idea and, um, and doesn't feel like their transcript looks perfect and um, like it's not possible, like it totally is because I was on that, on that journey and I was also second guessing myself, but it's, you can turn things around like any time and, um, and you can be the perfect candidate for a school like UC Davis. Great, um, so some people are asking how, what does a week look like as a med student and how are you able to manage families, relationships and your personal time? Well, I can see, I can talk a little bit about us as many, uh, like the, the second years, because the second year, each year is like very different. Um, so, so you know, so when you take the MCAT, right, it's kind of like the, one of the big exams you take before medical school. So now second years, we're preparing to take the step one, um, which is kind of like, the, it's the first licensing exam that every medical student has to take an entire country. And it's pretty much like a culmination of all the knowledge that you have been taking for the past two years. So it's a lot, right? So it's just like a lot of stuff that you have to know and you have to pass that, especially if you want to go into a competitive specialty, you do have to pass like failing is pretty much like not an option. And you should, in, at this point, I feel like a lot of people are just going to pour their soul and just like pass it. So a regular week for me personally, it just looks like I come to the, um, um, this like, we have like a building here, it's called Betty Every More, and I just grab one of the little rooms here. And I come here like at seven in the morning and I just stay till like 7 p.m. That's what I've been doing for the past like almost two weeks. So, and the rooms are nice. So I just come here, do my thing, eat here, I go for a walk and then uh, do that. But this is like a very unique part of the medical school right now because we just started for that exam. 
I will say before that you do have a little bit, you do have time to do that. You have time to like, especially visit my family in San Francisco, something that I always enjoy to do, or they will come here and visit me. Um, also kind of like keep up with your hobbies is something that I tell people always to do. Just kind of, if you do play guitar, do sports, work out or something, keep doing that. Don't, don't let it kind of like just go in the side and just forget about that. Always keep the, those things in mind that you've been doing before medical. So it's that important for you to keep, uh, head and then and then pretty much I will say like keep your family like close. That's one of the main decisions that I that I did for me to stay at Davis because I did have the opportunity to go to other medical schools, but Davis was ultimately for me because I um I wanted to stay close to my family. And in the U.S. as an immigrant, I only had my mom and my brother as my only family. So I was like, I don't think I want to leave them yet. Maybe in the future, even if I'm old, like 33, I still want to be close to my family to see, you know, when they're nearby and they might need something or anything. I do want it to be available for them. And as well, they wanted me to be there um, and I wanted them to be here. So that's what I, that's all something that you also take into account as well, your support system. And don't let them just go by the side or forget about them or anything. Just always do something to, to keep them next to you. But um, yeah, like the first year is different than the, the second. And so maybe uh, Juan or Marisa can talk a little bit about that. Or if any other, like Christina or Nina, want to add to the second year. Um, yeah. Um, I can answer since I don't see Juan unmuting himself. Um, so for first year, each block is a little different. The very first block that we had, which is kind of like, I don't know, a mini semester, we did anatomy and that's really busy and involved. So we were at school every single day, but that's because we were doing dissections and we also had in-person lecture. Um, so that was a little different from the rest of first year. The rest of first year, we only have required in-person things Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. until 12 p.m. And so the first hour is problem-based learning. So we're with our small groups and it's like eight folks um, and a medical doctor who's a facilitator. And we're basically learning about a case and um, answering questions about cases. And then we have team-based learning, which is essentially the same thing, but it's our entire class. And then we have peer teaching which is um, teach back sessions where we're using clickers to answer questions. It's very low stakes, but just making sure that we've been keeping up with the material. Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have pre-recorded lectures. And so Tuesdays and Thursdays are essentially free days and you can structure your days however you'd like because we are only in class for a few hours um, on three days. So again, like I said, if you budget your time correctly, um, at least in like first year and half of second year before step studying, you ideally can do a lot of fun things like play soccer or like go out to lunch with friends and stuff. And just going off on that question, um, are you currently able to hold a job while going to school? And um, is your schedule each year predetermined or is there, a, is there a variety in your courses? Is it set to four years or can you accomplish classes faster? Um, so for, I can answer this one really quickly. So personally, I myself, I don't uh, have a job. And I think just given the rigors of medical school is a bit difficult, but not to say it's not impossible. Um, between Marlisa and I and, and our classmates, there are several people who do hold jobs in our class. Some hold positions as uh, as interpreters, some work positions as tutors. Um, specifically at UC Davis, there's an opportunity for you following our anatomy block um, early on to work as an anatomy tutor for at the undergraduate campus at UC Davis. So there are different opportunities. I guess it just goes back to time management, whether you are able to effectively able to schedule that into your schedule. Um, and then regarding the, I guess, uh, trying to, uh, I believe, uh, trying to finish classes a bit faster on time, I believe was the second portion to that. Um, typically, but at least at Davis, everything's pretty much set. Um, and I guess there's not really way, one way to like, uh, you know, up yourself to get faster or anything. You're kind of in pace with everybody else. And that's perfectly fine. And, you know, I think that's one of the good things in a way because it kind of helps you out in a, in a way to see how others in your class are viewing different topics and really just gives you a better understanding of like how people are understanding and proceeding with various different topics, whether it's related to physiology, to pharmacology, 
and really helps you build, I guess, that breadth of knowledge as a um, as your own individual self, and then you know different considerations when you become a future physician. Thank you, Juan. Um, there's also a question about for those who have taken a post -bac, um, people want to know what is a post -bac and what is the differences in them. A post -bac is anything after a baccalaureate degree is given. And so after college, um, it can range anywhere from one year to two years. And sometimes students will do it for different reasons, whether it's because they need to actually take the classes that were the pre-med requirements and they didn't take them during undergrad because maybe medicine wasn't on their radar. There are certain post -bacs geared just for that. And then there are others where you've taken time off of school or you want a GPA enhancer and you need to demonstrate to medical school admissions committees that you can withstand the rigors of medical school. And so there's other post -bacs for that as well. Um, <clears throat> I went to UC San Diego's post -bac. It's a year long and integrated into the program is every quarter there's a class that introduces you to some concepts that you may see or encounter in your first two years of medical school, which are called like pre-clerkship years. And then we take like upper division um, science courses on campus alongside UC San Diego, like college students. And so um, that was the framework that exists for, or that is the framework that exists for UC San Diego's. Um, but again, each program will be a little bit different. At a minimum, just post-baccalaureate means that it's a program that's done after college. Thank you. Um, can you guys talk a little bit more about the reasons of why you chose UC Davis? I can start with this one a little bit. I chose UC Davis because I knew um, based on some orgs that I had been involved with and students that I know who were already coming here. I just really like the vibe here and um, they have a really diverse group of students. And as a non-traditional student, I definitely wanted to go somewhere where I would see more students like me who had similar experiences. I mean, in this panel alone, you know, there's a lot of us who are non-traditional students and that's always nice to be around people who understand what you've been through and um, who are just like not out to compete with you really that too. Um, because there are some programs that are super competitive, you know, and like top notch and, and that do require you to be um, that way as well. So I didn't want to be in that type of environment. And also because I'm from Northern California, I'm from Hillsburg, um, Sonoma County. So I wanted to be somewhere close to home. That's super important. I know um, some of y'all have talked about having a, a support system, being close to family, and that is super important for me as well. So being two hours away and being able to go home when I see my cousins and my mom and stuff is, is really, really important to me. Um, also, um, there's also a question going off on that question. What are your favorite and least favorite things about UC Davis? Mm, I, I, I like, um, something that I do like is that it is not in Davis. Like I like that it is the, the medical school is located in Sacramento um, because I, I think, I don't know, like Davis is too small of a city and coming from San Francisco and then having lived in LA before and before that being in Buenos Aires in South America and also being in San Salvador, I live in like big cities pretty much. So I was like, I don't want to go to like a very small city because I don't know what it's going to be in those places. And so I do like that it is not in Davis. Um, at the same time, like I would say, like being in Sacramento is not like being in LA, if you're thinking like that, or like being in the stuff, because it's like a smaller, a smaller city. So if you're looking for a more lively place, the place is on close at 10 p.m., you know, maybe Sacramento is not the place for that, but, but uh, so it has like, it's, it's cool because it's not in Davis, but it also, Sacramento is not LA. As, as an example, it's not San Francisco. Um, I do like that Davis has its own like, little contained campus and the, the the hospitals that are across the street. So if you're working with any like doctors that you might be doing research with or you want to network or stuff like that, 
it's like literally across the street. You can just go to the OR there or like go to the, I don't know, the Mines Institute, which is down the street and work with neurologists, so psych psychiatrists, things that you want to do. So so that's pretty cool because everything is just its own contained campus. And they're like improving it a lot. There's like a lot of construction going on. It's going to be like this huge Aggie Square here, like a new surgery building. They did a new ophthalmology building behind the medical school. So it's really going to look really nice in like five years. So it would be like, it's going to be pretty cool if you decide to come here. It's going to look completely different from us. And you're going to get to enjoy it. Not <laughs> So, yeah. Thank you. Um, someone asked, when did you start working on your medical school application? And when did you realize you were satisfied with your final draft of your application essay? I actually need to hop off now, so I'll answer at least my part of it. Um, but in terms of the medical school application, so I applied during the cycle of the pandemic, and that really changed things externally that were not in my control. So for example, like my MCAT, I didn't take it until July, which was not in the cards. I wanted to take it in March, but it turned out to actually be for the best. And then with respect to my personal statement and the work and activity section and all of those sort of like written portions, um, I had friends look it over as well as people I knew at the post back and have them vet it. And that was like a really good opportunity just to get outside input about how other people are seeing the words that I'm kind of writing on a page. And I finalized my application probably in May so that there was time um, basically to do two things, to finish the post back and to study for my MCAT. And so for me, that meant that finishing it in May really made the most sense, um, but it could have looked different. And then I think in terms of satisfaction, one of the things that a friend of mine had told me was, you know, the, the committees themselves aren't going to pour over your personal statement the way that you did. Like you took time and you know, really thought through how you want to describe yourself, but they look at it for probably three minutes and they're looking at thousands of applications. And so just kind of like putting that help lift a weight in a way for me to be like, okay, like as long as I don't give any red flags, like it's, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And then the other thing that helped me just get satisfied was, am I being as honest about myself as possible? Like, is there anything that I'm holding back that would let them not see me for me. And maybe it's with age or maybe it's with whatever, but I think just wanting to be the most authentic version of myself was really critical for me to feeling satisfied with my application because as competitive as medical school is, you kind of want to go to a place where there's a fit and that might seem really obscure right now, but as you interview and as you meet these programs, you kind of begin to see, oh, maybe I actually wouldn't be the best fit here or bring the most to the table that I would to another institution. And so to kind of summarize that, um, was it honest to me? Like, could I stand by that even like two years later? And I can say yes. And then the second thing was just kind of realizing it's like one small piece of the puzzle. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Nina. Um, someone asked, what are what are some experiences or volunteer work that is ideal to help us guide us to help guide us through the idea of what medical school or the medical field would look like? I volunteer in my local hospital, but what exactly is an ideal volunteer work? Um, I don't think there's like an ideal volunteer work for a medical school. So I I the only volunteer experience that I had were like two things in my app. So when I was in, in school, which is back in 2011, I did volunteer for this thing called Sunday Friends um, in San Jose State, which was pretty much, they had like this middle, uh, no, it's like elementary school. I don't know, it was like middle school. I think it was like a middle school. So parents and their kids would come to this middle school near San Jose State campus. And then all you would do is like, uh, they set up like this little fair and you would help them connect with resources and you would either like you know help them fill out an application for food stamps or for anything like that or we were just like trying to like read their letters that were in english that would translate into spanish in that sense when the parents would bring them to me so that's what i did what i was that was a long time ago through volunteering 
The other thing that was probably closer to volunteering is something that uh, uh, I did for a very long time because I, I did practice capoeira, which is the Brazilian martial art, and I did that for uh, like 15 years or something like that. So there was like a opportunity for me to, in that same studio in San Francisco, to just kind of uh, be able to teach the classes for the kids or the other team. So I would just volunteer my time to go there and teach those classes or play music with those uh, kids or with other other people that were like me and teach them how to play like the different Brazilian instruments that we used. And I was like volunteer. I didn't get paid to do that. And I would just do it, but it was kind of fun. Um, so that's, well, I never volunteered at any hospital. I never did anything like medical related at all. Uh, I did do that as a volunteer. And specifically, the capoeira was brought up many times in the, during the interview because people, I, I think it was just like very different from what they were usually seeing. They would ask, hey, what is this? Why did you do it? Why do you like it? Why did you do it for like 14 years? Um, what is it about it? So they wanted to know a lot more about it. It, was, it is not the act of why you do your volunteer, but like your your commitment to what you do. If you like to teach people play piano, like go ahead and do it. It's like, it's something like really cool and that will look good in your application. So it's kind of... That would be my advice. Thank you, Julio. There's um, nothing. So there's not, asking. There's nothing worse than laughing. Than doing, no, there's nothing worse than laughing than doing what you don't enjoy. Do the things that you enjoy, because then you could talk about. I mean, like Julio, the first couple of minutes you get to know him, he talks about, you know, Capoeira all the time, you know, and so that's something that's important to him and. He's always been uh, very passionate about it. So, um, yeah, I think it, finding joy in what you do is, is, I think, is really important. Before we move on, if I can just say something, I know there are programs out, out there that do kind of give you an immersive experience into medical school, um, like MedPEP. At, um, I don't know if that one's here or at UC Davis or UCLA, but they have similar programs where you get to come and and do some classes or something like that and get involved in research. I know there's programs like that at Stanford too, like a summer program that you can do. So um, those do exist. I would start by looking at UCLA, um, Stanford and UC Davis for those summer immersion programs where you kind of do get a sense of, of med school and, um, and get to connect with future mentors. Yeah, and actually we've had both of those programs come and do presentations the Stanford summer one for community college students. Um, so go back and look at some of the previous units. We also had the director of the NIH's training and education program come and do a talk. And from that talk that she did, five people that came um, got those programs. And these are all fully funded. Like I think the NIH one pays you like seven grand, including housing. So go back and look at some of our previous events because a lot of these things have been, you know, talked about and their directors have talked about what they look for in their applicant. So I would highly recommend you to go look back at some of our past events. Um, but I'll put the links with the other ones in, in the chat as well. Could you guys talk more, a little bit more about the MCAT and what resources did you guys use to study? When did you take it? And what was your study method? I can share a little bit about the MCAT because it I feel like it was kind of like this high writing piece in my application since my grades um, were, I mean, my GPA as a whole just wasn't really like the ideal GPA. So I put a lot of effort into studying for the MCAT. And I will say that I, at first I tried and failed to do the Kaplan course, um, but it does work for some people. It is structured and you can, I, at that time I did it virtually. So I was like going to these classes and they were teaching concepts and they assigned some uh, questions or something like that. But it ended up not working for me because I was working um, and I just didn't have time to follow the program that, that they were putting out there. And also, it doesn't always necessarily like these courses don't cover the areas where you're weakest in and that you need to make the most improvement in. And most of the mentors that I talked to were telling me like, you just have to do you basically like take the pre uh, the practice exam, see the areas or the sections where you're scoring the worst and just focus on those um, as much as you can. 
And that ended up being the method that I took, a very like um, individualized approach to it. And I did a lot of UWorld questions. So I feel like that's just a must. You have to get UWorld and you have to do practice questions. It doesn't have to be UWorld, I guess, but you know, you definitely, it, it is ideal if you can, because they're very close to what you'll see on the exam. Even when you study like for step one right now, you know, I'm doing a lot of UWorld again. So I'm getting like those flashbacks. But, um, but yeah, definitely do as many practice questions as you can. And um, I did that as well as Anki. I started using Anki actually um, during the MCAT studying. And what Anki is really helpful with is bringing up these topics or these equations and things that are easy to forget because they're just equations and you're just using rote memorization to uh, remember what they are. Um, so yeah, as much active review as you can with those questions, with flashcards, um, taking practice exams every two weeks at first, you know, and then a lot more frequently um, as you go through your study period. So I started off like every two weeks and then closer to the end of my exam, I, uh, or closer to the date of my exam, I was taking one like every week. And practice makes all the difference, you know, even for the car section, like the much dreaded section of the MCAT, like I thought I would never do well in that section because you have to read these long passages, right? And it's like so draining um, to basically read somebody's mind on this exam. But the more you do it, the honestly, yes, it does work, like the better you get. And you may even like start to enjoy it. I would like everything that Christina said is correct. Like you were, but I personally think like you were like the greatest thing because we use it for right now for step. And just like the questions, they look similarly to the practice uh, questions. The explanations are great. Uh, you can do, you can, you view it as like a learning tool. So you answer those questions the best you can. And obviously you're not going to get 100% of that. Let's say you get like 60%, 70%. And then you read through those things. And it's kind of like you're reviewing it at the same time. And then you can use Anki to reinforce the information. So my advice is like to do you well. I, I personally, like similar to Christina, I I because my grades were way, way too old and then I had to like do the, the post back to move on my GPA. Um the MCAT was my way to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm I'm like just an older student. I am ready. Look at just look at the score that I got. So it's like everything else is from the past and now this is my most recent thing to seem like myself I need to protect myself like you know I, I mature to all those years and all the difficulties that I had in the past that are like gone and now I'm able to overcome those so the MCAT was my way to say hey I mature academically and I'm ready to do this and the way I did it was through using the UL. Um so if you have a chance if you buy one thing in in, Medi in before taking the MCAT I would say apply for the fee system waiver for the AAMC to get those free tests thing, question banks. But if you want to buy something, buy you world, because that that is definitely the best thing that I, I've used. And like Christina said, we are using it right now for step one, because the thing is great, like, honestly. <laughs> Shameless plug, uh, next week, uh, tomorrow we have two people that scored in the 98, 97 and 98 percentile and did the, the MCAT on their own without paying for a prep course. And I think they both did UWorld. And the following week, we have somebody that's going to go over how to use Yonky, Anki, space repetition, and all that stuff. So uh, shameless plug. And we, you know, Christina didn't know. So just wanted to say it wasn't done on plan. Um, can you guys just talk about each on average how much how long did it take you to study for the MCAT? I mean, everyone's different, so since I answered the question, I'll just quickly say I studied for six weeks, but this was very dedicated study time. So I was fortunate that my um, my boss at work uh, actually gave me that time off, and I just used. Um, basically like PTO and stuff to cover that period for myself financially, but I was able to take six weeks off and um, study just for the MCAT. I uh, just want to quickly chime in on that. Uh, likewise, very similarly, six to seven weeks on my end, but I should also preface this that I actually took the MCAT a total of three times. Um, so just to know, like, you know, you don't have to take the MCAT at least once and like, perfectly ace it and then you know, you could fail. And as long as you show improvement, 
that's the really the main thing, y'all. So, you know, work, just keep at it, work hard, um, and it'll definitely pay off in the end. But, but Juan, you didn't take it. You didn't take it the first time just for practice, right? Because there's a lot no. of things in chats that we've read and on chat blogs that said, "Oh, we're just gonna take it the first time as a practice." So, yeah, in in real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like I guess at least I guess I could go talk about it briefly. So during my first attempt, I think I spent around four months studying for the MCAT. So beginning in June, and roughly ending in September, um, I spent that time studying for the MCAT for my first attempt. Uh, for my second attempt, I spent uh, about about similar time period, about five months. And I think just for me personally, um, having that background experience and with also you know with the intention of passing the MCAT. And then going into my post back program really gave me, I guess, the experience necessary um, as far as study skills, as well as the content knowledge needed to uh, help me do well on the MCAT the third time I took it. So it's going to be like different considerations, but definitely uh, spend as much time as you need. Uh, don't try to rush it um, into taking the MCAT, basically. Also, um, for, for me, it was a little bit. Um, different because I, I was working and, and I took it during the pandemic. So I was uh, at the session working with the Department of Public Health. So I had to work like 60, sometimes 60 hours a, a week. So the way I study, and it was like all very sudden. So I, I only had about three days a week, sometimes four days a week that I could study. And it was only like in the evenings. So what I did is like, I told my mom and my brother, hey, you know, I'm going to go to San Francisco State Library or like some other place that I can, or even like the office at, at the hospital, I would just grab my office that I had there. I would just go there and like study. And I was just doing it like constantly, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when we're mostly in Wednesday and Sunday, I would take like a practice exam or review questions or whatever I needed to do. Um, and, and as long as you have that routine, it's the most important. If you repeat the routine constantly, that's going to be good. Uh, for me, overall, the time, because I couldn't just study all the time like I'm doing right now, it took me probably like three months and a half to feel ready for the MCAT just, just because of the, because I was like working pretty much like full time. Yeah, so similar to Julio, um, I was an essential worker. I was working in banking at the time. So I actually studied for six months for the MCAT. Um, so I would work from nine to five, and then I would come home, eat a quick dinner, and study from like six to 10 p.m. and go to sleep and do it all over again. So there's a lot of factors when it comes to your MCAT studying, and you need to do what's going to work for you, right? So you're like six months. Wow, that's like I can really do six months. Um, but maybe you can get it done faster, right? Because you're not working or you don't have family responsibilities. Or maybe you do, right? And you're a mom and you're working part time. And so you can't do it in five weeks, but you can do five months. Um, so it really depends on your situation. And I know sometimes we compare ourselves um, and we think that other folks have the right way, but whatever works for you is the right way. Yep. And I think uh, Marla said, I think that's the most important thing is um, I, for example, for OCHEM, um, one of my lab study mates maybe takes her an hour to study something. It takes me like two and a half hours. So um, she's just much smarter than me. So and learn and picks up faster, you know, but we still get to the same point. So. Um, somebody was asking about, um, uh, about like, did you, did, did any of you, um, did medical, uh, uh, medical scribing or anything like that? Cause that seems to be the in thing. And some people are saying that it absolutely, and some of the boards are saying you absolutely have to do scribing. Um, and I just wanted to see if that's true or. Have you guys, is everybody in your class have done scribing? Anyone? Nope. So, yeah, so um, off. Cuban, if I can just um, add that, um, just based on my experience with folks who have done scribing, it is a great experience, but um, one thing that like the reason why I decided, like actively decided not to be a scribe is because it 
it doesn't pay very well. And honestly, like I needed to pay rent and bills and things. So you don't have to do scribing. It's a great, wonderful opportunity. Don't get me wrong. But there are so many other things like Julio mentioned that you can do um, to prepare for medical school. And I do just want to throw in there that I think clinical research coordinator, that is like the best thing I did pre-med because not only was I able to do research, even though I didn't publish, but I was able to work with patients in a clinical setting. So don't feel like you have to be a scribe to go to med school and to get that experience. There are so many other ways that you can get that clinical experience and be really immersed with the clinical team. Yeah, I would say the same. Um, describing was like an option there, but I needed the money and it, it, it doesn't pay pretty good. And I was exploring the option to, especially after the transition from the bank, that way from the bank, the money then went really down because there's no way anything in public health or anywhere's going to pay the same as working in tech or finance, right? So um, I did work for the Department of Public Health. That's an option that I always tell people, just explore careers with the local Department of Public Health that you, whatever you work in, if it is in Sacramento, uh, if it is in the Bay or LA, they all, they usually have openings and then you can explore those and see. Uh, they do take a little bit to hire you because it's just the government is very slow in many things, but but they do offer uh, pretty good salaries and benefits. They give you clinical experience, opportunity to work in public health. Uh, if you work for a couple of years, they even contribute for your 403B for retirement and all of these things that most people kind of, at, at, when you're young, don't think much about those things. But once you're like 50 and you haven't contributed to one of those, you kind of, hey, I should have done it when I was younger. But uh, those are like just things that benefits that we don't take into account at the moment. But uh, those are really, really, really good things to do. And then they gives you a broader, I will say like, because they got a lot of people that describe it, but you'll be unique in the application. So you do some type of public work or you do like like this, the clinical research coordinators, a lot of academic institutions, like Christina was mentioning, they have that like UCSF has a lot of those positions, Stanford, UCLA, I think here Davis has a couple of those. So those are like great to explore and they pay you better than any describing position. Yeah, and I think the, the the biggest thing for clinical coordinators, you need to have a bachelor's degree where scribing you don't. Now, a lot of people are asking a lot of public health questions. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the deputy director of public health for California who came and did a talk, and he wants to pay students to go to local public health and pay you $10,000 a year. The only thing is you have to be an enrolled student. So if you, any of you go check out his talk, and he has a slide on there as well. You could look at it. There's all this contact information, and um, you could start. And I think, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's ten thousand a year for academic year. Anyways, but look at it. I don't remember all the details, but if you, if any of you are interested in public health at your local public health office in your county, this is obviously in California. So I'm sorry that if you're outside of California, I don't know much information there, but. Um, but I'm sure there's other programs out there. Someone asked, what did, um, what's something you wish you knew before starting medical school? Something that I wish I knew, and it's very cliche and people always tell you, but truly like comparison is a thief of joy and don't compare yourself. Um, UC Davis is very conducive to a collaborative environment. Um, and sometimes you're like, oh, well, this person is studying this way and I'm not doing that. But everyone is truly and really different. Um, and the best study method is the study method that works for you. And especially in the beginning of first year, and like even now, I just figured out and optimized my way of studying. Like we are all lost. <laughs> Um, and no one has the answers and people are all rooting for you more than you think, um, and all much more happy to help you than you think. Um, and so your classmates are your support system, definitely not your competition. Um, and to just be very aware of that, um, and do what works for you.
There's also some questions about research. People want to know, how do you get research after your bachelor's, during your bachelor's? Um, and is there a specific type of research that one is supposed to do in order to be a more competitive applicant for medical school? Well, I will. I would say like, um, because you don't 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 think that you know you have to like do research and have publications, right? Like that. That's that's what most people think is before medical school, right? Well, in medical school, it's a little bit different because it really depends on where you're going and if you want to have publications or posters or abstracts. So that's a different thing in medical school and before. So before medical school, nobody is expecting that you're gonna be publishing in like the New England Journal of Medicine on like stem cells or some some crazy thing like nobody's gonna expect that most likely they want to know if you can work in basic research be it like clinical or be in lab research or anything like that and that makes it, it does stand out in the application but it doesn't break your application if you have that it's just kind of like a like like a little bonus for for the applications that i was able to screen like there were a lot that had no research but people had work experience they had all the things that they could they could use to stand out um it depends on how you play those 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 benefits and they say you don't have risk equally valuable so it, it it really depends it really depends on all of those things so i wouldn't i would say like don't feel like you have to 100 percent get research and then if you're already doing some research, you'll feel like you have to be polishing in nature every month uh, because you definitely not even people in medical school do that. Like that's people that that's their career, like PhDs and stuff. So don't feel like you need to do that at that level. Um, yeah, that, that's just my advice. But uh, if you want to get some research, the easiest way I would say is an academic institution. Like any any UC will be good. And if you happen to be one that up, and if you have your bachelor's, apply to their jobs, the the CR, the clinical research coordinator jobs, because that would be like the best way that you can get plugged in into research. Otherwise, you're gonna have to like network and find people and try to propose things that you want to do. But uh, um, but yeah, but don't feel like you need to have that. I just want to add um, definitely everything Ponyo said, and also there are summer research programs for students who are transitioning as well. So. If there's an institution that you're really interested in, see if they offer anything. I know um, there was mention of like the NIH program, things like that. So just literally you can hop on Google and do like medical school research programs out there and start to look at them. Or it's been a long time since I've been on the AAMC's website, but I'm sure they have a section or there are resources out there that kind of list different types of experiences available for um, students interested in medicine who want to get into research. So that's just another option, but there are a lot of different ways to get into research. One being applying, uh, one being these programs that are out there and available for folks who are interested. And another thing like Julio mentioned is just talking to your professors um, if you're in bio class or even if you do a post back and, and start taking courses there, you know, just doing networking and seeing who has a research project and whether you can help. There's some people also asking about your extracurriculars and what, if any, do you think made your application stand out? Extracurriculars like in undergrad prior to applying, it seems like? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was involved in a lot of things. Um, at San Diego State, I was part of Chicanos Chicanas for Community Medicine or CCM, as many of you probably know it. I was also really heavily involved with Mi Mentor, which is um, a national mentorship organization uh, for six years. And I had various roles there. So if you're not involved with Mi Mentor, I really recommend that you get looped in. They have a lot of great resources. I was also part of this program um, in San Isidro, San Diego, called the South Bay Health Leaders, where we receive mentorship directly from physicians. Um, 
I was very heavily involved in my church as a, a worship leader and as a Sunday school teacher, right? So not everything is about medicine. I was also a tutor for kids K through 12. I was a tutor for student athletes at San Diego State University. Um, so I had I had a lot of different experiences. Um, yeah. Um, I, I would say for for me, so when I was in in, in undergrad, um, I didn't have any extracurriculars because I didn't know I was going to go to medical school at that time. Like there was like something at that. So, so just the disclosure at that time, I didn't think I was going to medical school because I was also undocumented. So I was like, I don't know if I have a future in this country. So it was kind of like the weird situation back in the day. But taking that apart, so I never thought about like doing extracurriculars that to make myself better. So so I just did things that I enjoyed during that time when I was working and eventually decided to go to medical school. And those things that I enjoyed doing after I graduated, I have been doing for a very long time. And those are are, are things like, like I was mentioned before, like volunteering, just teaching kids how to play the capoeira instruments. I, I did that for upwards of like 12 years. Um, just the, the, the other thing that I enjoy was like going taking salsa classes and dancing tango and those extracurriculars where I, I took those classes at community college even after I graduated so I would do that and then I framed those extracurriculars because I had this gap from since I was 23 until I applied to medical school when I was 30 so during those seven years uh, there's like a lot of things that can happen in your life right so so I used those longitudinal things as my extracurriculars during that time and it's just things that I just happen to enjoy and I actually wrote those things in my application and then I think, uh, um, like like I mentioned before, it's just something that I do feel like the medical schools like is longitudinal involvement in anything. They do like because like think about it, like you like Nina mentioned it before. She was saying it's kind of like a like a marriage thing, right? It's you go to medicine and that's all you you're going to do for a very long time in your life. So you're going to be doing that commitment for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So they want to know that you sure you're sure you have a track record proving that you like to do these things for a while. And so if you do, if you I don't know, if you like to cook, for example, and you like do really good things in cooking and you do cooking classes or you volunteer in a cooking kitchen or something and you're doing it for a long time, that looks really good. Uh, they like that because they say you're going to just a person is like there's something more that they do in this, not just for looking good in their application, doing it because they have a passion for it and that's what they actually want to see and 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 i feel like that's what like when you go to medicine that's the thing right you will be doing this for a long time the tests never end they they're always here they always come back even after you become an attending they, they always come back so you have to be committed to doing this and that's kind of what a long long student commitment to an extracurricular shows yeah thank you for that um, there's someone asking, do you guys find it hard to balance your finances as medical students, given that it's hard for you to have a job outside of medical school? Um, I can share a little bit about this. Um, so I did have some savings before I started medical school, which was nice and is nice to have. But I will also say that I was like very, very scared about what my finances would look like when I started and what I would be able to do and not do and afford and things like that. But I was, you know, I talked to people who were already in medical school and they told me not to worry about it too much that it'll actually be okay. And, and um, you know, the you can get loans and things like that. And that happened to be the case. So I was like actually really surprised um, and very relieved that, it wasn't the case that I'm, I'm struggling a lot with finances. So yes, it is stressful taking money and loans. I, I just like try not to think about it, but, um, but there are many scholarships out there that you can get. Um, and I know um, some folks here can talk about the scholarships that they've been able to get and stuff. So, so just don't worry about that. Like I think borrowing at least some amount is just gonna be a, a fact for a lot of people, including for me but it's it's a lot more manageable than you think and you can make it more manageable by getting scholarships as well thank you christina there's some people also asking about sorry give me a minute
what do you guys think was part of what like what part of your application made you guys stand out or what do you guys think made you guys stand out oh i could probably answer this one um so for me i think personally I, um i guess i can't i guess really to kind of put it into words is like i think I, there really wasn't anything unique about me per se um but the fact that I think uh, I kind of represent more so like what a typical person from a rural community, um, the type of experience that I have would have. And I think for me, and I think for maybe the admissions committees, they value that here at Davis as far as the different levels of walks of life that are needed to really help you as a future provider understand your future patients better, right? So for me, um, I really made an emphasis in my application to talk about what it's like living in the rural community where you have this rotating door of physicians, physician shortages, um, among a variety of other topics and really disparities that, you know, were made it pertinent to me as a future healthcare provider that I want to be able to address and be able to tell that side of my story, I think really has made it maybe unique about me in that sense. Um, just really understanding that medicine needs to diversify and that even you, you know, if you don't think there's nothing unique about you, that's um, okay. And that's going to shine through um, in your application. Um, the, the only thing that I would just add is that um, I don't know, Juan, I've met him like two minutes before we started and just hearing him. Like, he's passionate about his community and going back to his community. He's done it all through undergraduate. He's gone and, and tutored. So he has this track record. So he's not like when he applied to medical school, says, I really want to go to my community. He has like four or five years of track record of doing that by tutoring, going back, being committed. He didn't just start the day he applied to medical school. Oh, I'm going to go back to my community and 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 do that. And so make sure that if you are your and there's nothing wrong if you want to be a plastic surgeon. If you want to be a dermatologist, like do those things, because I think those are as important as a primary care doctor in the inner city or in a rural area. But don't just make that stuff up because they will know it. They, they see that track record. Uh, Marlis said, I mean, all through undergrad, she was involved with me mentor. She's involved in in mentorship and she's done all these things. And she's also done is doing it in medical school. So I bet you 50 bucks she's going to do it in residency and when she's practicing. Same as Juan, uh, same as Christina, and I'm pretty sure Julio is going to do his Brazilian capoeira when he's in attending, which, you know, and so that's the, it's the, the one thing you find is the, they're all really passionate about these things. They were able to talk about it and show that track record. So it's not something magical. It's everybody's looking for this magic and there is no magic. Like follow your passion and purpose. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I, I, yeah, that's like that's uh, very well said. Uh, I, I think like if you were to ask me, because the question is like very, it's like a very deep question as to what made you excel, right? So that means you have to look at yourself and say, okay, what about me? Do I think that they like, right? So. I, if I'm like completely honest, when I was applying to medical school, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm like older, like they're probably going to judge me harder. They want to see that I am mature and all of these things. They want to see that I know what I wanted to do. Um, and, and, and I was like, would they look at me if they compare me with a younger person, let's say like a 23 year old. And they say, okay, if we get this 22 year old when they're 30, they're going to be a full on doctor. This guy, when he's like 40, is when he's going to be like a full on doctor. Right. So that also had me a little bit nervous. It's like, okay, um, what, and I had to look retrospectively in my life, all the, all those previous years and all the jobs and whatever random things I did, I had to say, and, and, and then say, okay, what, what did I gain from those things? And I would, and I think it's something that was very valuable was, especially in, in interview, see, interview system was that whenever they asked me a question about every topic, I had, I had like a list of situations that I had already gone through that were similar, even if they were not related to medicine at all, right? They like I remember like one of the like one of the funniest uh, things that they asked me was, um, you know, what is like one of the 
weirdest problems that you like one of the hardest problems that you had to solve in your life uh, it was like an interview at uh i think it was like a drew in ucla and then i was like you know what i was sort of getting in the bank I had this guy who wanted to buy a boat and it was like, we had to find him alone for a yacht. And so I was like, the whole, and then the, the, the interview was like a yacht, like they didn't know they give loans for that. And so the, the question, they, I didn't even answer the question, but I was like framing how I would have, what I did in that job. And it was so interesting that they found out that people get those type of loans because they didn't know, but I, I just had like a lot to talk about and that I feel like that is what, these people appreciate it because if you draw from many aspects of experience in your life and me being, I consider like me being like an older applicant, I did have that. And, and that did give me like a, a um, made me like a very good interviewer. Cause I like when I write things and essays, I'm not the best, but, uh, but when I interview, I think I have like very good skills because, because I can draw upon a different, different things that I have experienced in my life to find similar experience that can apply to the question that's being asked. And I think that that's what made me um, excel in those interview seasons. Yeah. Someone is asking, how do you manage being in the medical field without a support system? Or in other words, how do you create those relationships with classmates or other medical students? Oh, um, I just want to put, put a quick plug in for this question, because I actually had met Marlisa uh, through Mi Mentor uh, prior to starting medical school. So, you know, I think it's programs like Mi Mentor um, that really help out with kind of setting that community up for yourself and like in the future, whether it's just for networking or if you're going to start like a post back program or medical school, right? It just goes a long way to kind of like create that network, even if you don't have the support for yourself. And... Because, you know, with pe with people like with Christina, Marlisa and Julio, I mean, especially for me coming from a rural community and coming to Sacramento, which for me was the big city, it really feels like I created that home away from home and having that, you know, external family that's just going to support me no matter what, that understands um, all the challenges and tribulations that come with medical school. And, you know, I think as Marlisa kind of put it earlier, you know, we're all struggling together. We understand what's going on. And I think that's just one of the kind of the best things about medical school is that you have each other's back. So definitely programs like Mi Mentor, uh, networking opportunities for pre-med, uh, such as conferences and such, um, networking in general, uh, really go a long way. I also think that like, you can't be afraid to knock on doors. And I think that's something as um, folks who have been like historically marginalized, we have like ganas or just like the will to succeed. Um, and that's really important, like kind of not taking no for an answer, right? And knocking on doors and calling people and sending emails. And if they don't email you back in a week, like, hi, I'm sending a follow-up email or just like cold calling people. Like, I think you also like have to have a drive within you to seek the answers that you need. A lot of us come from uh, first generation households. Like many of us are probably the first to graduate from college. Many of us may be the first to have been born in this country in our families. And so like even our parents can support us um, emotionally, right? But they may not be able to support us or have all the answers academically. So kind of just being brave enough to put yourself out there. And literally just ask, be like, oh, that looks like a person who would know what I need the answer to. I'm literally going to ask them. Um, and so I think that's really important. Like, uh, what do they say? Like, closed mouths don't get fed, right? So if you want to know about something, like, you kind of have to build up, like, the guts and the bravery to just ask and put yourself out there. Yeah, it's you have to take risks. I mean, I, I this is the question. I think it's becoming a joke now is people always ask about, oh, what's the percentage of admission rate? And I always like to follow up and say, well, I could tell you that there's one um, uh, information uh, uh, number that I could share is 100% that don't apply, don't get in. So that's one of those things, like um, you're just gonna have to take a risk. Now, taking a risk also means like getting to the people that actually can answer your question of other pre-med students, blogs, all of the stuff. I mean, they're good, you get ideas, but they're not like, you know, 
uh, the the ultimate and there's a lot of bad information out there i mean some of the questions we just get submitted you're just kind of like okay where did this come from um and so do you know you know we've we've had almost 24 deans of admission come and they pretty much like talk about the same exact thing follow your passion do your thing find opportunity be resilient um i've had some people say hey you know because of covid i've been available to find opportunities well there's a lot of people that are finding opportunities and so there's a lot of resources we've had a lot of like programs that have come and talked and we post them um, both us and other organizations like me mentor we post them you're just going to have to apply not applying to them um, it basically means that you're not getting them and so uh, and just showing up like showing up being being present um, like like I said we had the NIH thing and five people that came to that session I kind of knew one of them but like they apparently were networking through it and then like five of them got to this community college thing out of 40 people. So you just have to show up and you have to find those resources. And I think what Mar Marissa was saying was is being resilient. Like it's hard. It is hard. Certainly if you're first gen, don't have anybody else in your life, it's it's hard and that's where you build community. And community, the nice thing is we have these little thing called phones now that your community can be anywhere. And so if you can't find it at your school, um, there's other places that there's a lot of programs that are out there. We have another question. Someone is um, asking, are you concerned about your age when you are done with medical school residency? Um, and how does that affect if you want to have a family eventually? So I kind of, I answered this in the chat, but I'll say it again. So my personal motto is the time will pass anyway, right? So you can be 40 years old, living your best life, living out your dream, or you can be 40 years old, regretting it and wishing you had gone for it. Regardless, one day you're going to be 40. So what did you want to do? <laughs> it's kind of your choice. And that's how I see it because medical training is long, right? And if you want to go into competitive specialty, it's also long, like Julio said, like he might be an attending at the age of 40 years old, but that's okay. Um, he's going to be 40 anyway, right? Does he want to be an attending living out his dream or does he want to live in regret wishing that he had gone for it? And now maybe he's in primary care, not loving his life. Um, so the time will pass anyway, and it's really up to you, um, what you're going to do with it. I yeah, I just put a link on there. There, we had five women that one of them now is a faculty at UCLA, the other one at UCSF. They were all single mothers when they were pre meds at community college, and now they were pre they were single mothers this entire time, but now their doctor is making four hundred thousand dollars a year versus getting by. And and we also have another woman who was a single mom, and she's an orthopedic resident, and um. And, you know, she's kind of like, yeah, but you know what? It's only going to be a couple of years, but I'm going to be making half a million out when I'm done. So like it's like I said, what Marissa said earlier, it's resilience and sacrifice. Um, and Julio could talk a little bit more about that, but Julio is going to be 45 no matter what, unless he finds like the magic of not aging. He's going to be 45 next year. I'm already, <laughs> yeah, I'm already almost 35, Marisa, so it, you know, <laughs> I'm getting close to that. No, but but like honestly, like what you said, like Marlisa, that was like pretty much encapsulated what drove me to change the careers from going into the bank and like doing wealth management to like applying to medical school. Because I I I remember mean, it was one of these, it was one day that I was just doing computer work at the bank. And I was like, you know, this this job is too easy. Like I I, I came to like the US and I don't like harder things. What do I see myself doing in 30, 40 years from now? It's like I don't want to be in the same desk, just trading stocks and whatever so I don't want to do that um so so I started exploring I was like should I just go get an MBA should I just like do like a MPH or something explore that and I was like maybe I should pursue medicine right maybe because that was like a back in my mind it was always being there but I had I, I kind of like let it go because I was like I'm too old I don't know what to do and then so I explore like getting the the you know, the post back done. And I try to say, okay, if I do this path, I'm going to reach 40, 41 if I, when I'm on a full-on attending. 
And like Marissa said, he's like, do I rather be in medical school like that and enjoy at least the journey? And like, now that I'm here, it's pretty fun. Like, honestly, like you get to learn stuff. You go to the clinics, you go to the OR, which is like nice. You get to scrub in, you can do research, you can do a lot of pretty cool things. And you enjoy, like, it's not like you have to put yourself when you're like 40 and say, okay, when I'm 40, I'm going to be happy. No, you can enjoy the journey too. And the journey is pretty cool. Like I gotta say, like being in medical school is really, really nice. You get to meet cool people. You do all of these other things, and ultimately, like the best thing is when you, when I reach that age, you know, I'm gonna be an attendant, and I'm gonna look back and say when I was like 25, I made the right decision, you know, because I could have been stuck in that same desk with an MBA and be unhappy there, even now be like still 45. But I'd rather be like doing my surgeries when I'm 45, <laughs> and that's gonna be a lot more enjoyable for me. Um, it, 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 you're talking if you want to have a family and all those things, of course they're gonna be hard. But like having a family is always gonna be hard. So might as well like I have classmates that literally had two babies in in medical school. They had two babies. They raised a family, and they're doing it. And she wants to go into neurosurgery. One of my classmates, and, and she's doing it. She's doing she's doing all of this in medical school. And she said, it's going to be hard anyway. So I like my kids and that's what I want to do. I'll, I'll do it. Um, yeah, that is making the decision the hardest thing. But once you make it, you feel good after. And you just enjoy the journey until you become the, the attendant in whatever field you want to go. So it doesn't matter the age, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we had Dr. Alavi. I put his link in there. He basically ha had his own successful car mechanic business and decided that he wants to go to medical school in his 40s. He started medical school at 47. Now he's done and he's like 56, but he's like, yep, I'm an ER doc and I jump out of helicopters because he does light medicine in Cleveland. And he's like, and I'm doing like, you know, but he was very comfortable and he decided to be uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, they're actually going to make a TV series out of his life um, on one of the networks. So yeah, I mean, you know, like, you're going to get old no matter what, like, you know. Um, this is a question that I think, I think this is something that I, I found, like, this is a repeated question that comes up again and again and again. Um, and I think it's just, I think it's, it's a lot of first gen insecurities about, like, people asking, like, how do you work full time and go to school full time? And how can you uh, not work while you're in medical school? um and being able to survive and so this is i think this is an anxiety for a lot of people certainly a lot of people that are first gen or parents you know that don't have the income and can you guys please share a little bit about that um, i can talk a little bit about working full-time as a student which i did mostly while i was in community college and um, I will acknowledge that it, it is difficult, you know, especially when you're starting out in college and you're trying as a first gen student to get the ropes in higher education, because I personally didn't know anybody I had like one cousin who went to to college to university that I could actually talk to about that. But everybody else in my family, including my parents, had not gone to university. So trying to navigate that while, you know, making um, going to work. Uh, eight hours a day and things like that like it's very hard and um, and personally for me it's it's something that I ha I did have to cut back on work a little bit when I started at undergrad and it's a conversation I had with my parents and um, about needing more like financial assistance and I was privileged in that way that I could ask them for a little bit more help um, financially so I could do well in my classes and, and do well at UC Davis. So that might become a reality for some of you too. And that's just what my path looked like. And um, finding that balance is hard. I think it gets easier with time because when I started to work at Stanford and, and doing the, um, the post back, I was also working full time and going to school. But at that point I had learned how to manage my time better. I was better at avoiding distractions and I was able to actually excel in it. It's something that I'm still able to do in medical school, like balance my time in a way where I can do extra curricular things. I can take care of myself and still do well in my classes. So 
I feel I wish there was like a magic formula, but you just have to keep trying to work on on your time management skills, you know, get ideas from people. How do you study more efficiently? Um, so you have you can maximize the time that you have. But I personally don't have any like secret ingredient to excelling. It's just a matter of of practice, you know, continuing to always do your best and and then having conversations with with family members or about maybe needing their assistance if if you do need to. Someone's also asking in relation to that question, what should work look like when planning to apply to medical, to the medical field or when being interested in applying to the medical field? Um, I think that work should look like whatever you need it to look like. And everybody's situation is different. So I got a science degree and I realized I was going to make more in banking than I was working in some bio lab. And what I needed at the time was money to be able to pay for my medical school applications. So I went with a job that was going to pay me more money because that was better for my situation at the time. Um, if that's not your concern and you need experience, well, then work is going to look different for you, right? You might go scribe, you might go be a medical interpreter, you might go be a MA um, and something that's more conducive to your goals. And so I think work is going to look different for everyone. And you need to find out like, what does work need to be for your situation at the time to make you successful um, in matriculating into medical school? All right. So um, I think uh, does you guys have any other last uh, um, last questions? Because it's like way past our time and I actually start working 15 minutes. And if I don't go out there, my my uh, my charge nurse is going to come and drag me out of the office. So um, any last words of wisdom uh, before we go? I would say just keep on going. Um, there are a lot of obstacles. Medicine is difficult, but more than difficult, medicine is just a lengthy journey, right? So it's easy to become unmotivated when like you get a C in Gen Chem 100 or when you're studying for the MCAT or as you're applying. But if you literally, this is what I tell everyone, if you literally just keep on going and you keep on trying, um, then there's no way that you won't get here. You just have to be really persistent. And that's my biggest piece of advice. Failure is inevitable, but just get back up um, and keep on trying. And that's my biggest piece of advice to you all. I will say like, um, I think like, uh, uh, like, like Marlisa and I mean, and everybody reiterated here saying that medicine is like long, it is long and then, but, but like to find a way once you, since the moment you apply to medical school and then hopefully get in, like find a way to enjoy that. And, and then, and there's like a lot of stressful things going to happen. You know, like this, like right now, step one is pretty, it's kind of crazy because it's a lot of stuff, but, but you kind of find enjoyment in that and, and then appreciate that you're like here and the next year I'll be in third year. And for today, the fourth year had a match day. And then that's kind of like a reminder of what we are all here trying to, to, to get to. And it was like nice to see them. They're done with all the exams. They match. They know where they're going to go. And then they go on and go and under actually being like a doctor is actually like working. And that's what we're here for. That's what these four years are preparing us to do. So kind of like keep that ahead. Okay, okay, what it, what comes next and enjoy it. And I don't put your 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 mind just like looking at the end goal, which is just like, yeah, I want to graduate. But yeah, you're going to graduate in four years. But what happens in those four years in between is like, you know, you want to work, you want to make friends, you want to like explore career opportunities, you want to make yourself the best applicant possible. Enjoy those little things because they, 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 they some of the sports that I was speaking to today, they say, yeah, you know, it just goes by so fast. And then after that, you're just in four years ready to go work. And the journey is long. So you kind of make, a, make one commitment and be sure that that is the commitment that you want to make because you don't want to find out in 10 years it's like yeah you know this kind of is not good for me you want to find you want to know for sure that this is the commitment you want to do and do so some self-introspection and know yourself to kind of embark on this yeah uh, my 
but I guess final advice for y'all is be your own advocate. If anything else, it's such a process. I think you may, you know, Julio and Marlisa can talk, you know, resonate with this. It's such a tough process. And, you know, there are times where going through it, leading up to it, and even now medical school, there are times like, you know, like, what, you know, what did I get myself into? Right. And really, you uh, all I say, just gotta say is just have the confidence in yourself that, you know, everything's gonna work out fine. That, you know, as Marty said, pointed out, be comfortable with failure if that's the case, because it, eventually it's all gonna culminate in this wonderful experience, which you might have rest, some rough, rough patches, sure, but it's gonna be worth it in the end. And really just be the best advocate that you can be for yourself for all these opportunities that are waiting for you. And just know that, again, everything's just gonna work out in the end. All righty. Well, thanks everyone for coming and hopefully we'll catch you tomorrow.